Dr. Mike Strauss is a David Ross Boyd Professor of Physics at the University of Oklahoma. He conducts research in high energy particle physics, currently with data from the Atlas Detector at CERN Laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, where he studies the fundamental particles and forces that make up the universe. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Science from Biola University and his PhD in Experimental Elementary Particle Physics from the University of California in Los Angeles. His previous research was done at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, tonight he's going to be talking about the scientific evidence for God and the naturalistic alternatives, though I think we're going to be airing on the naturalistic yeah. alternatives. Yeah. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Strauss come up here and Thanks. get started. All right. So as was mentioned, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, by the way, it's sad that you guys are in the SS SEC now and not in the Big 12. We really miss you. And who knows, you might win more games in the Big 12. But anyway, uh, that's a joke. I'm just joking, all right? Um, so, yeah, Texas A&M is a great place to play football, I have to admit. Uh, but I know football is not very important here, much like University of Oklahoma, where football is not very important. <laughs> um, I'm a professor there. I do research and teach, of course. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, and then we'll talk about the other subject, because you have to know what I do in my real life. Um, so I study the elementary particles of the universe. This is the slide that discusses it. Um, and this is what the quiz will be on at the end. So um, we know the universe is made of atoms. At the center of every atom is a nucleus. Nuclei are made of neutrons and protons, and neutrons and protons are made of quarks. I've spent much of my career studying how quarks are put together in neutrons and protons. So how do you determine what a neutron or proton is made of? It's too small to take apart. There are no tools you could reach inside and pull it apart and see what it looks like. Um, so let's ask the question, how do you know what it's made of, it's put together? But suppose you wanted to know something more um, concrete, how it was put together. Let's say your car, and you didn't have any tools to take your car apart, but you want to know how the car works. Well, if you're an experimental particle physicist, here's what you do. You get the car going really, really fast, and you smash it against another car going really, really fast, and you see what comes out on the other side. So um, do this with your parents' car, not with yours, of course. Um, this is what we do at CERN Laboratory near Geneva, Switzerland. Underneath the ground is a tunnel about 27 miles around to give you some perspective. Uh, here's Lake Geneva. Here's the Geneva Airport, and then this is the tunnel. Um, 27 miles around. The main CERN complex is over here. That was what was in this picture there. And in the tunnel, we have these superconducting magnets that bend the protons around the ring, the 27-mile ring, or 27 kilometers, 17 miles. Um, here's a picture of, the of one of the magnets open, and you can see two pipes. Each pipe will carry protons at nearly the speed of light, and 40 million times a second, the protons collide and we build big detectors to see what will happen when they collide. So this is an artist's depiction of the tunnel and a cavern for the detector I work at called the Atlas Detector. It's really just a big camera to see what happens when the particles collide and what comes out. And it is big. Here's a drawing of it. Here are people there and there. So that gives you some idea of its size. Protons come in at the speed of light on both sides. They collide. They make a lot of debris and the computer takes pictures of the debris, and from that we try to understand the structure of the universe. This is one of those pictures of one collision, and all of these um, tracks, all these lines are particles that were created when the protons collide. In chemistry class, you learn that you can't create or destroy mass. In physics, you learn that chemistry is wrong, and we, <laughs> we create and destroy mass all the time. And so this is massive particles created from the collision of two protons. Uh, so that's what I do in my day job, um, but I'm not only a scientist, I'm also a Christian, so I give a lot of talks on this subject, Modern Scientific Evidence for God. And so what I want to do tonight is very, uh, is not pull the cord too much, is very briefly go through the Modern Scientific Evidence for God. If you've been in Ratio Christi, this will be a lot of stuff you've heard before. If you haven't been in Ratio Christi, then I'm going to go through it way too briefly to really get a feel for it. But I just want to us to be all on the same page, so I'll give you three reasons for modern science that I think give evidence for God, and then I'm going to talk about the non-theistic response, because people like myself, for over 50 years or so now, 
have been saying there's great evidence for God from science. And some of those who don't like that message, particularly in the last 10 years, have written a number of books to try to confront this evidence. And if you look at my desk, you'll see I read as many books from people that I disagree with as I do read books from people I agree with. And so I'll summarize um, the arguments that I've read from people that I ultimately disagree with and why I think the evidence for God from science remains really strong. I've probably talked for maybe um, 40 minutes at the most or so, because um, you'll be sick of me by then, and then um, I'll let you ask questions and we can go from there. Uh, so these are the three pieces of evidence, the origin of the universe. Um, the origin of the universe uh, looks like this in modern cosmology. A hundred years ago, we had no idea that the universe had a beginning, but now all the evidence seems to point to the universe having a beginning about 14 billion years ago, and it really is a beginning. The whole universe, space, time, matter, and energy seem to have come into existence. Um, I don't know what it's like not to have time or space or matter or energy, um, my waistline takes up more space than I like, and I <laughs> spend more time on Earth than you would care to know. But anyway, <laughs> it seems to be a point when we didn't have any of that stuff. But, and since that moment, the universe has been expanding from this hot, tiny, hot, point-like region. We get the visible universe we see now. Now, this is often referred to as the Big Bang, but you really need to understand that scientists actually use the word Big Bang in two different ways, and they never really define which of the ways they're using it. Historically, it meant the origin of our universe, the very beginning. But more and more scientists use the term the Big Bang to mean sometime within the first trillionth of a second or so after the universe started to expand, when we kind of understand the physics and chemistry that comes into play. So when you read um, articles, there was an article recently, I think it was, I can't remember if it's the Wall Street Journal or someplace, that the title was, the Big Bang wasn't the beginning of the universe. Well, that's because they're using the second definition of the Big Bang. If I define the Big Bang as the first trillionth of a second after the origin, then it's clearly not the beginning of the universe. And but yet the, the headline made it seem like scientists are somehow questioning the Big Bang. Um, they're not. They're questioning what happened from time equals zero to time equal 10 to the minus 12 seconds or 10 to the minus 30 seconds or something like that. But in this talk, I'm going to use the first definition, the historic one. That when I talk about the Big Bang, I mean the moment of the origin of the universe. Now, scientists don't like the fact that the universe might have had a beginning, which is what the Big Bang is, and so um, they have only come to accept it. We have only come to accept it because the evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is so strong that there's no alternative. Um, and the evidence comes in three pieces. The universe is expanding, so if it's expanding now, it must have started to expand. Um, we can um, do calculations to determine how much hydrogen and helium there should be in the universe, and our calculations match what we see exactly. Hydrogen and helium were formed in the first three minutes after the Big Bang. And then we can measure the temperature of the universe. The universe started out very hot and very dense, um, and it's been expanding and cooling since but um, we should measure the residual heat from that original um, hot, dense universe. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it's measured so precisely that we can even see uh, slight deviations in this, this, what we call CMB, and everything we see exactly matches uh, what the theory is, even the ripples in the cosmic microwave background radiation. So all the evidence that we can observe points to a Big Bang, but also theoretical evidence points to a Big Bang. Einstein's general theory of relativity, which I know since this is Texas AM, you're all very familiar with, you probably do the calculations in your sleep. But anyway, um, it, it predicted that the universe was expanding. And he developed that in 1915. In 1973, Roger Penrose, Stephen Hawking, and George Ellis took Einstein's theory and added the idea of space and time into one theory. Actually, that was part of the original one. But what they showed is that Einstein's general theory of relativity actually predicts that time should have a beginning. Um, and so then in 2003, uh, three other physicists, uh, Borde, Guth, and Vilenkin, came up with what we now call the BGV theorem, which I'll refer to quite a bit, because it's really an all-encompassing theorem. What it says is that any universe that is, that is expanding on average must have had a beginning. It can't have be past eternal is the words they use. So all of the observational evidence 
and all the theoretical evidence point to the same conclusion, that the Big Bang is the origin of everything in the universe, space and time and matter and energy. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, although most of these guys were pretty smart, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist. That's a joke, because these guys are really smart, all right? But um, to, to realize that if the universe had a beginning, then the origin can't be part of the universe. If the universe had a beginning, then the cause has to be outside of the universe, not a physical part of the universe. So science has stumbled on the idea that the universe has to have a transcendent cause. Whatever started it has to not be part of the universe. And theists have been saying, this, is, this looks like God. Who would have predicted 100 years ago that in 2019 we would now say that the universe had to have a transcendent cause? Um, so scientists still don't like the idea that there's a beginning. They're constantly trying to find a way out of it. And we'll talk about some of those ways. Because if the universe had a beginning, then it looks a lot like God. Um, the universe also looks designed. Uh, this sometimes goes by the name the anthropic cosmological principle um, from the Greek word anthropos, which means humans. And the idea is that many, what I've written here, many of the parameters in the universe seem to be precisely tuned to allow humans to exist. Um, let me just give you two examples. One is the strength of the strong nuclear force, which is what I study. Here's what's on the quiz. Everything is made of atoms, nuclei, neutrons and quarks, neutrons and protons. And the strong nuclear force binds the quarks together in the nucleus and eventually binds the nucleus together in the atom. So um, it's the exact strength of the strong nuclear force that is responsible for the periodic table, which we all know and love from chemistry class. All right? So if you were to take the strong nuclear force and make it just 5% um, uh, stronger, it would basically eliminate hydrogen from the periodic table, which would be a problem because water is H2O, the sun burns hydrogen. If you were to take the strong nuclear force and make it, so 2% stronger would eliminate hydrogen, 5% weaker and the periodic table would just be one element, hydrogen. So that would make um, chemistry class really easy, of course, <laughs> but life impossible. Um, another thing that's finely tuned is the amount of matter in the universe. So as the universe is expanding, everything is attracted to everything else by gravity. If there's too much matter in the universe, then everything collapses really quickly in a few million years and there's not time to form planets and stars and galaxies. If there's too little matter, the universe expands really quickly and there's not enough gravity to form um, stars and planets and galaxies. And Shortly after the Big Bang, in the first 10 to the minus 12 seconds or so, the amount of matter in the universe was finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 60th. If you had changed the amount of matter at that point in time by one part in 10 to the 60th, we wouldn't be here. Now, um, I once gave a talk at Stanford, and I explained that this was a fine-tuning uh, parameter in the universe, and a fellow physicist who I know came up to me and he said, you can't say that this is fine-tuning for the universe. And I said, why not? And he said, because there's a mechanism we think we know about called cosmic inflation that forces the universe to have the right amount of matter. That no matter what you start with, the end product is what you need. But this got me thinking. If I have a mechanism that no matter what I start with, the end product is exactly what I need. Isn't that finely tuned in and of itself? You know, it's, it's like a funnel. This looks like a funnel. If I have a funnel that forces all the gasoline to go into one hole in my lawnmower, isn't the fact that the mechanism works also a finely tuned parameter? And so just because I have a mechanism, it doesn't mean that there's not design behind it or tuning. An efficiently tuned mechanism requ still requires an explanation and still shows design and fine tuning. We're going to come back to this later because this becomes important. So I've only mentioned a couple things, but there's lots and lots of things that are finely tuned for the universe to exist. The final thing I want to talk about is the rare earth. The idea is the answer to this question, what's required in order to have a planet that can support higher life forms? Um, again, I don't want to go through everything. I'll just go through quickly and point out maybe one thing that I want to come back to. But you have to be in the right kind of galaxy. Only 10% of the galaxies are spirals like our Milky Way. The rest are elliptical and irregular galaxies and they don't support the right kind of star formation. You can't be too close to the center of the galaxy or too far away. You have to be in what's called the galactic habitable zone and our sun is right in the middle of that. 
You have to have a star like our sun, a class G star. Other stars don't burn long enough and stably enough um, to support planets like the Earth. But the one feature of our sun that I want to come back to is the fact that it's a third generation star. So the first stars that were ever born after the universe, um, stars like everything else have a lifetime. The first generation were only made of hydrogen and helium because that's all that was there. As stars die, they actually create heavy elements. So the carbon in your bodies came from the death of a previous star. A star died, it formed carbon. Uh, that carbon, along with other stuff, coalesced into our solar system, and some of that carbon became who you are. But the second generations of stars don't have enough carbon and iron and silicon to create plants like the Earth. So you have to have a second generation of stars, at least one, um, live for a while, go through its lifetime, and die. And then the third generation of stars is the youngest star that could have a planet like the Earth. So if you start with the Big Bang and you want to make a single planet like the Earth, you have to go through at least three generations of stars, which takes about nine billion years, which is when our sun stored, was, was formed, nine billion years after the Big Bang, about four and a half billion years ago. So if you um, read people like Carl Sagan or watch or read his book Cosmos or saw the ancient movie Cosmos, in that movie there's this question um, or a statement made that the universe is huge and the universe seems much too large if we're important. We're, why all the empty space? But the universe is not too large because get this, you, you want to make a universe that can make a planet like the Earth and you start with the Big Bang. The quickest you can do that is 9 billion years. And in that time, the universe continues to expand. So the older the universe is, the bigger it is. So if the shortest amount of time it takes to make a star like our sun is 9 billion years, this is also the smallest universe you could actually have and have a single planet like the Earth. So as gigantic as this universe is, it's about 90 billion light years across, at least what we can see, it's the smallest universe you could have starting with the Big Bang, and have a single planet like the Earth. The question isn't, why is the universe so big? It's, why is the universe so small? It's as if we were planned from the beginning. And that's going to come back later on. Um, I don't want to talk about, well, I will talk about one thing. Uh, tectonic activity is required to have a planet that can keep um, water on it. You might think tectonic activity, which causes earthquakes, it looks like terrible, devastating things. But it's actually been shown that without tectonic activity, we would not be here. So next time you see an earthquake and you wonder where's God an earthquake, the answer is he made earthquakes so we could exist. Without tectonic activity, we wouldn't be here. In their book, Rare Earth, Donald War, or Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee say that tectonic activity may be the single most important thing in creating a planet that can sustain water for a long period of time. Um, so scientists know all these things. They make amazing statements like this. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Alan Sanders says, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something instead of nothing. Alan Sandage was an agnostic atheist or atheist scientist, astro astronomer who saw this kind of evidence and eventually became a Christian. Right? So what have I said? This is the summary of the, there's three pieces of evidence that I've depicted for um, God. First is the Big Bang, that the universe had, a, universe had a transcendent origin. That was originally developed in the 1930s. We still have more evidence for it. The anthropic principle, the universe appears designed for humans, and the rare earth hypothesis that the habitable earth seems rare. Uh, this is when they started to be developed. There still is research at all the time in this. In fact, I started talking about this kind of evidence maybe 20 years ago, and the evidence today is stronger than it was then. But because theists like myself, Christians like myself, have been saying this for a long time, there have been a lot of non-theistic responses by Stephen Hawking, Larry Krauss, Victor Stenger. These are just some of the books, the many books I've read that try to refute this evidence. So I want to start with maybe the first modern book that really made a strong effort at trying to refute the evidence, The Grand Design. It came out in 2010. 
So I read this book, and it asks three questions at the very beginning. Um, why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we exist? And why this particular set of laws and not some other? And when I read those questions, it occurred to me that he's trying to answer three questions that are directly related to the three pieces of evidence I just gave for God. Why is there something rather than nothing is the origin of the universe. Why do we exist is at least in part because of the rare earth. And why this particular set of laws and not some other is the anthropic principle. And even though this was, you know, 2010 and we've been discussing these things for 30 years, it occurred to me, why did they have to write a book? It's because the evidence is so overwhelming that if you don't believe it, I said the authors feel compelled to write a book to show why the evidence isn't compelling because people like myself keep saying it is. So um, this is a question that is in the forefront of people's minds, particularly those people who don't believe it. So I want to go through the three pieces of evidence again, the rare earth, the origin, and the anthropic principle, and give you the arguments that those who don't believe they point to God um, will propose. And I'll start with the easiest one. It's the rare earth. And the argument simply is there are lots of planets, so one must be suitable for life. We found over 3,000 planets. Um, there's probably at least um, 10 to the 22nd or 23rd planets in the visible universe. So there's a lot. But the question is, what is an Earth-like planet, and should we expect to find other ones? If you read in the news that they found an Earth-like planet, they mean one of three things. They don't really mean Earth-like. They don't mean something like you see in Star Wars or Star Trek. What they mean is either the planet is about the same size as Earth. Well, Venus is about the same size as Earth. It's one of the most inhospitable places in the universe. Or they mean that the planet is rocky and not gaseous. Well, Mercury is rocky and not gaseous. You don't want to go there. Or they mean that the planet might be in a zone where it has liquid water. Well, Mars might be in a zone where it has liquid water. So really, when you read they found an Earth-like planet, they don't mean that at all. In fact, I read an article by um, Brown, I forget his last name, an astrophysicist at Caltech at the Wall Street Journal, who said, we got to quit saying we found Earth-like planets, because the public misunderstands what that means. So you can do a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation looking at the probability for an Earth-like planet. It's got to be in a spiral galaxy. That's a 10% probability. The star has to be the right distance from the galactic center. That's a 20% probability. It's got a tectonic activity. We don't really know how many planets do. We know that none in our solar system have the kind of tectonic activity that's necessary. So you guess at a 5% probability. You just make educated guesses. That's what a back of the envelope calculation is. And then you multiply the probabilities together and you get an answer. But this is only a partial list of everything we know that's required for an Earth-like planet. This is a more full list, okay? Um, and the list keeps growing. I just don't have the fortitude to keep it up to date. There's 322 parameters here, and the probability of them all coming together, including correlations, if you care about math, is one part in 10 to the 304th. Of course, there are at least 10 to the 22 planets in the universe, okay? So the probability of finding an Earth-like planet by chance is one part in 10 to the 282. This is in the visible universe. We don't know what's outside what we can see. This is what we can see. There might be lots more out there, and then this number would go down. So when you say, well, there's lots of planets, so one must be like the Earth, that's just a naive statement. You don't have to be very sophisticated to do a back-of-the-envelope calculation. It's just, it's just wrong. Now, you know, there are a lot of planets, and, but all you have to do is look at the literature and see what's required. So this is the easiest one to refute because there's no numbers that tell you one should be like Earth. The numbers tell you just the opposite. So what response have we had to the fine-tuning? Um, well, let me give you this response of John Barrow and Frank Tipler. So these were the guys that wrote the definitive book on this in 1986. Again, things have been developed since then, but they wrote this book called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. And here was their thoughts. The universe is so finely tuned, there must be a real designer. There has to be a real designer. It's not just an accident. But there is no God, and so he can't be the designer. And they go through a series of arguments to explain that there is probably no other intelligent life in the whole universe. And they have reasonable conclusions, reasonable reasons for that. So here's the problem that they have. It requires an intelligence to create the universe, but the only intelligence in the universe are humans. So who creates the universe? 
You see the problem? Their solution is that humans will evolve and become like God, and they will reach back in time and create the universe for themselves. So this is the picture of that, okay? Right? Get, it's a joke, right? That's not really, all right? Now, nobody, no other scientist I know believes this, that humans will evolve to be like God and reach back in time. This is one response to fine-tuning. The more prevalent response to fine-tuning is something called a multiverse. And this is the one that most non-theists believe now, that there are many universes, and we happen to live in one of the few that can support life. Now, how you get a multiverse depends on what model you have. There's no definitive model of multiverses. One of the major ones is something called M-theory, or string theory. It has a parameter space of 10 to the 500 ways you can fold the spring, the strings, basically. So there's possibly 10 to the 500 different types of universes. And so this is what most people believe who don't believe in a God. If you have enough universes, there has to be one that could support life, no matter how improbable it is. Now, the first thing you should know is that there's no evidence for any of these other universes. These are not other galaxies. These are not even the universe beyond what we can see. These are other universes. So to me, this is a blind faith belief. It's not a belief based on ev any evidence, and so certainly not scientific. And even the scientific community understands this. I love this quote by John Horgan, who, quoted, who wrote this as soon as the grand design came out in 2010. M theory, theorists now realize, comes in an almost infinite number of versions, which predict an almost infinite number of possible universes. Of course, a theory that predicts everything really doesn't predict anything, right? And so, you know, I'm a scientist. Real science is based on experimental results, not speculation. There, there's a debate whether string theory is even science because whether or not it can create, uh, whether it cannot make any real predictions or not. Um, so this is what people believe, I mean, every one of my colleagues either believes there's a God or believes in a multiverse because the universe is so well tuned. So let me give some more thoughts on God in a multiverse then. First, as I said, there's no observational evidence that there are any multiverses, but suppose there was. Suppose we discovered evidence that there are other universes out there. How would that affect this evidence for God from design? Would that solve this fine-tuning problem? Well, the first answer is, I don't know, because there's so many different multiverse theories that I don't know how to respond to anyone unless we find one that actually works. So until you actually have a theory that you can show is the correct theory, you don't know what the implications are. But every multiverse theory says that most of the universes don't have life. So we still live in the right one. That's just a selection effect, but it's interesting. But the other thing that I find interesting is let's suppose, let's just suppose that this universe is based on string theory, this M theory. And let's suppose that string theory, in order to work, requires 10 to the 500 universes. So let's just make that hypothesis. Then what we would say is if you're God and you want to make one planet like the Earth and you want to use string theory as the foundation, to do that you have to make 10 to the 500 universes. Because that's the theory, that's the model on which you're building the universe. Okay? Just like this universe, which seems so big, is the smallest one possible for us to exist, maybe 10 to the 500 universes is the smallest number possible if we're to exist. Who knows? Because we don't know the answer. Um, maybe the laws of physics require a multiverse to make one planet like the Earth. So maybe when we, if we develop string theory, we will know that the universe is 11 dimensions. And that whoever started the universe must be an 11-dimensional being at minimum, or 11-dimensional cause. That would maybe give more evidence for some transcendent God. So maybe the discovery of multiverse will actually strengthen the evidence for God. Every other discovery we make keeps strengthening the evidence for God. And then finally, the hypothetical question, how many universes would an infinite God create? One? Three? A million? Right? So to me, the science says, let's look for multiverses. I'm confident that if what Christianity claims is true, then multiverses are going to strengthen the case for God, not diminish it. And maybe the multiverses are fine-tuned. By the way, a new paper just came out that even questions whether string theory requires 10 to the 500 universes. 
it says the parameter space might be much smaller. And I, have a, and I have a colleague who's betting that maybe one day we can get down to one and only one possible universe. And then you get back to the fine tuning problem. But that was, that's what scientists would like. This is the only one possible. That's why it's here. Okay. Um, I have a colleague who works in an organization called Reasons to Believe named Jeff Zvierink. He's written a really nice little tiny pamphlet called Who's Afraid of the Multiverse? And if you really want to go into this in depth from a Christian perspective and see that a multiverse is not a threat to these fine-tuning arguments, I'd recommend this little pamphlet. But the, maybe my favorite response to the fine-tuning argument is Victor Stinger's. He says there is no fine-tuning. It's all just a mirage. It's all um, there because the laws of physics require it. So he wrote this book called The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. Two scientists, um, Luke Barnes and Grant Lewis, two Australian astrophysicists, wrote a kind of response to it, and I'll talk a little bit more about this book in a minute, called A Fortunate Universe. This is one of the best books I've ever read on fine-tuning. It actually takes every argument against fine-tuning and shows why they're not valid. So much more detail. But let me give you an example of how clever Stinger is in his arguments against fine-tuning. Um, here's his major argument. Now, this is a little long, but it's, it's important. He says, if our formulation of the laws of nature is to be objective, it must be point of view invariant. He calls that P of VI. And invariance implies conserved quantities. This is true. It's something called Noether's theorem. We'll get back to that. Thus, when our models do not pretend on, per, depend on a particular point or direction in space, point one, or a particular moment in time, then those models must necessarily contain the quantities um, linear momentum, angular momentum, of which are conserved, point two. Since point one is true, point two is true. And so the conservation principles, the laws of physics, are not laws built into the universe or handed down by a deity to govern the behavior of matter. They are principles governing the behavior of physicists. So here's the really subtle part. Everything he says is true, but scientists would never say that invariance implies cons conserved quantities they would use the term symmetry. So symmetry and invariance sound like the same thing in English, but in physics they're very different. So he uses invariance here because that's the correct term. He uses invariance here because he can then make the argument, but this is the wrong term. The term he should use here is symmetry, which doesn't mean invariance in physics. Now, the, the uneducated person would not know that. I read it and didn't see it. Luke Barnes pointed it out to me. He pointed out that he's using a term here that means something different than what the physicists use so that he can make this argument. Isn't that clever? Right? Isn't that lying? <laughs> the conclusion is based on a false premise. The word invariance in point two should be symmetry, and symmetry and invariant mean very different things. So Victor Stinger writes this popular book, The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. Luke Barnes, who's really a very bright um, young physicist, wrote a technical paper debunking every one of Stinger's points. <laughs> so, um, and the overwhelming consensus of those who read both publications is that Barnes' case is far stronger than Stinger's. And then Barnes and Lewis wrote this book. It's a really good book. Luke Barnes is a theist, he's a Christian. Grant Lewis is an atheist. And they wrote a book together because they said fine-tuning is so real. And they debunk every um, argument against it. And then that's about two-thirds of the book. And then the last third of the book is Luke Barnes explaining why fine-tuning points to God, <laughs> and Grant Lewis explaining why he thinks fine-tuning points to a multiverse. But the bottom line is it's fine-tuned. Okay. So Occam's razor says, what's the easier conclusion, one God or a bazillion universes? Right? I don't know. But this is some quotes from the book. This reaction against fine-tuning might stem from the belief that fine-tuning is the invention of a bunch of religious believers who hijack physics to their own ends. This is not the case. The field began in physics journals and remains with physicists. You can read the journals. They all, they all talk about the fine-tuning. This is not made up. While there is more work to be done, physics has tended to consolidate our understanding of fine-tuning. All right. So now let's go to the last thing, the response to the origin of the universe. So here's the bottom line. We don't have any idea what happened in the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds or so. 
Um, there's possibly something called cosmic inflation, which I mentioned it would wipe out any, mostly wipe out any record of what happened. So you can speculate anything you want in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds or so. Um, so there are a lot of proposals. The two proposals are primarily there was no real beginning or the beginning was just a natural event. Here's what we do know. At about 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, the visible universe was hot and dense and has expanded and cooled since. We also know, as I pointed out, that all calculations and all observations say that the universe had an actual beginning. The BGB theorem really has no loopholes in known physics. It has loopholes in unknown physics, in speculative physics. It applies even to a multiverse. So even if there's a bazillion universes, one, they had to have a beginning. All of them had a beginning. And then one thing I haven't mentioned is something called the entropy of the universe, which in lay terms is kind of the disorder in the universe. But Roger Penrose has calculated that the fine-tuning of the entropy at the beginning of the universe was one part and 10 to the 10th to the 123rd power, right? So that's a pretty small number. Most non-theistic models can't explain this low entropy. In fact, Sean Carroll, who's an adamant atheist and has written a lot on this, really throws out almost every model of the origin of the universe, except for his, because they can't explain the low entropy. So what do we know? We know that everything that's observable and measurable gives evidence for an actual origin with a transcendent cause. Therefore, if you don't believe it, you have to appeal to everything known, says there's a God or some transcendent cause. So if you don't believe it, you have to appeal to something unknown. You have to take this gap in our knowledge, the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds, and you have to propose that there's something that fills that gap that not only um, is something we have no idea about, an argument from ignorance, but that actually would overthrow the things we do know, general relativity and the BGB theorem. So I call this atheism of the gaps. You're taking the gap in our knowledge. Since everything else looks like theism, you're filling the gap with atheism because the things we do know look like theism. All of the proposals are speculative. They all require unknown physics to supersede the known physics. Almost every proposal contradicts BGV, and very few solve the entropy problem. So let me just give you a few examples. The first ones are that there's no um, beginning of our universe. Um, you can read this. It violates what we do know. I've said that. Even oscillating universes, even multiverses have to worry about these problems. Here's, here's an example of two of the most well-known solutions to no beginning. One is Stephen Hawking's no boundary condition. Um, it gives no singularity. That's a fancy word for an infinity. So the example I give is suppose you have an ice cream cone with a sharp tip. That sharp tip would be the beginning of the universe and everything else would, would come from that. But suppose you had an ice cream cone with a rounded tip. Doesn't the rounded tip still have a beginning at that inflection point? That's what his no boundary condition is. It basically replaces a sharp tip which is a singularity, a true infinity with a rounded tip, and he thinks that somehow gets rid of the beginning. It's like saying, if I go north until I reach the North Pole and turn around, I haven't really reached a turnaround point because it wasn't a sharp turnaround point. It was a gradual turnaround point. But it's a ridiculous argument. I don't know anybody who accepts it other than Hawking. Okay? This is another great one. These guys wrote a paper that made a bunch of news because it said the universe didn't have a beginning. This is a little technical. They, they did it with something called Bohmian quantum trajectories. So Bohmian quantum trajectories are a semi-quantum model of how the universe might have started. But um, you know in geometry, if you have two parallel lines, they never cross. And in this model, the only thing that would be a true beginning is if the lines would cross. But by definition, Bohmian quantum trajectories are like the parallel lines they never cross. So here's their reasoning. Let's start with a model where the lines never cross and come to the conclusion that they never cross so there can't be a beginning, right? You have a philosophical word for that. It's called circular reasoning. And, and this made big news because nobody knows what Bohmian quantum trajectories are, okay? Um, this is what Alexander Vilenkin from the BGV theorem said. With the proof now in place, Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. 
The other thing that I hear all the time is that the beginning of our universe was a purely natural event. That it was either stagnant forever and then it started, or it's one in a series of universe, or it's some kind of quantum fluctuation. Um, the stagnant universe, I'm going to go through this fast just for time. It's got so many problems. It's still not stable. Nobody thinks it could be, exist that long. So, so it's stagnant for a trillion years. It still had to have a beginning. Um, the universe in a series of universes, it's got so many problems with entropy and BGV. Um, almost no cyclic universe models solve any of these problems. So most people don't hold these too um, carefully. We were just talking earlier about a new model by Penrose, who he tries to get around some of the problems. Uh, but this is the major one, that the universe is some kind of quantum fluctuation. Um, this is Lawrence Krauss's uh, thesis in a universe from nothing. So in our real world, you can have these things called quantum fluctuations. You can have particles apparently pop into existence from nothing. But they don't pop into existence from nothing. They pop into existence from the space-time fabric of our universe, which really isn't nothing. It's a quantum field um, holder holds quantum fields that allow things to pop into existence. So even though he says, well, in our universe, they pop into existence from what we used to call nothing, but we know it's not really nothing, maybe universes can pop into existence from real nothing. Right? There's the false analogy. In our universe, they pop into existence from what we used to call nothing. So maybe universes can pop into existence from real nothings. Right? Um, but it's not true. It's, it wouldn't be a universe from nothing. It'd be a universe from some pre-existing entity, like a quantum field, that's transcendent from our universe. And, and many people, including non-theists, have pointed out this sounds a lot like God. Got a universe popping into existence from something that's transcendent outside the universe, which he has no idea what it is. So none of these models have any real basis. All the models, this is really important, all the models require some laws of physics to exist before the universe. And once again, Alexander Vilenkin has a great quote on this. The description of the creation of the universe from nothing is given in terms of the laws of physics. That makes you wonder, where are these laws? If the laws describe the creation of the universe, that suggests they existed prior to the universe. The question that nobody has any idea how to address is where these laws came from and why these laws in particular. I would take issue with him that nobody has any idea where the laws came from. Some of us have a good idea where the laws came from. Right? And let me say one more thing. Now, this is something that people don't think a lot. But suppose we were to find that this universe came from a quantum fluctuation. And I'm a Christian who believes in the Bible. Would that negate what the Bible says? Well, no, because there's a few things about the Bible. First, it describes the origin of our universe. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say what he did before that. If God used a pre-existing entity to create our universe, the first verse of the Bible would still be true. Our universe had a beginning of space, time, matter, and energy. That's all it says. It doesn't say how God did it. And so, the second thing is that if you read how God works in nature, he usually works through natural processes. The, the Bible says God feeds the lions, as if that's active. But we know lions hunt, so did ancient people. They didn't go out and say, ooh, look at the lions. God must be feeding them, so let's go pet them, right? They knew they hunted. It says God clothes the lilies. He causes the sun to rise. They knew these were natural phenomena. So if God normally works through natural phenomena, and he used a natural process to create the universe, that looks a lot like God. But the biblical record that this universe had a beginning, which is all the Bible says, has been confirmed. <coughs> no matter what was pre-existing, this universe had a beginning in space, time, matter, and energy. The Bible doesn't say where that came from other than ultimately God. So we find a, nat a natural cause. It hasn't done anything to negate the fact that this universe had a cause outside of it that is consistent with the biblical record. So the bottom line is all the evidence supports the divine designer. A century ago, there was no evidence on the origin of the universe and very little on fine tuning. And since then, all the discoveries, all the things we actually know show that there is an actual beginning of the universe and that the universe appears to be designed. This is developed in physics journals 
any attempt to refute these are appealing to, to ignorance, to things we don't know. So the non-theists must continue to do this. All of these arguments are gap arguments. They're taking things we don't know, overturning what we do know, and speculating that these things we don't know will somehow alleviate the evidence for God. So it makes perfect sense that the evidence points to a transcendent intelligent being that created this universe. Everything else is speculation. Um, to me, using every rule of logic and science, the explanation that best fits the data is the simplest one. And it fits all the data. You don't have to force anything. You don't have to say, well, this piece of data doesn't fit. And that's this one conclusion, that there's a transcendent intelligent designer and creator who has a purpose for humanity. That fits the data without speculation about anything that we haven't discovered. Right. So as was said at the beginning, um, this briefly touches on things. I wrote a book. This book was written, by the way, um, it's a short, easy to read book. It was written because there was very little that I could find that was written in very non-technical language that discussed the scientific and biblical case for some of this stuff I've talked about tonight. And so this is an easy to read book. It's non-technical and it discusses how the Bible and science agree on the origin and design of the universe. And I have other resources like stuff millennials care about, like YouTube channels and <laughs> Facebook stuff and stuff. All right, so that's what I have to say. We have at least 20, 25 minutes for you to ask me questions. Right. Yeah? It seems like uh, whenever you get into these kinds of questions, or sorry, it seems like whenever I get into these types of questions, what I run up against very quickly is a kind of a wall prevented by my depth of knowledge from digging deeper into these arguments. And so without majoring in physics, which I have no intention of doing. Good for you, yeah. My, my place already yeah. a wee bit full. Um, what sorts of things would be worth learning to try and peer past the curtain a little bit? Um, that's a good question. I mean, and, and even, you know, we were talking about some today that was an argument that I'm unfamiliar with. There's always going to be new arguments. If your goal is to be able to understand and rebut every latest argument, that's what you're going to spend all your time doing. So I would probably focus on the positive. You know, where did the universe come from if it had an origin? And if you think it's another universe, well, where'd that come from? Is there an infinite number? And then also understand, you know, that the atheists will say, well, you have just as big a problem because you're proposing God is infinite. You've just replaced infinite universes with infinite God. But, but that's the whole point. The point is that because infinite universes has lots of problems, including scientific but even logical problems, what the theist does is they say, you know, maybe there is a self-existent being. By the way, Sean Carroll has written a new article where he basically says the universe is a self-existent brute force reality. And, and he doesn't realize that by saying that, he's violating all the laws of physics. Nothing in physics is a brute force reality. If I told you this building is just a brute force reality, there's no cause, you would think I'm crazy. But when Sean Carroll says it about the universe, people go, oh, that explains it. Right? <laughs> so what the theist does is they say any explanation that appeals to a self-existent thing is not science. So we say outside of science, outside of the physical, there's a self-existent being. And that's logically consistent, whereas a self-existent universe is not logically consistent with the tenets of science. So what I would do is I would know the positive arguments. Where do you think the um, beauty, the fine-tuning, the exquisite design of the universe came from? Because there's always going to be speculative alternatives, but what's the most logical thing if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and whatever the saying is if it looks like design and looks like a transcendent origin and looks like a purpose for humanity maybe it really is and that's how i would approach it without knowing all the physics this is a talk you know for people who say well you know i know there's a lot out there has anything you know put the nail in the coffin of christian beliefs the answer is not even close just the opposite the coffin is wide open <laughs> you can follow that analogy. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I was. Hmm? So you mentioned earlier that 
in the physics, physics department, it's sort of like split between theist and multiverse yeah. believers. Um, but then afterwards, you sort of discussed how the multiverse might actually strengthen the teleological argument. So I was just confused as to why there was such, I guess, a divide there. Um, because physicists don't think about anything but physics. <laughs> physicists don't think about philosophy or what the implications of their beliefs are. They, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. I was also like thinking, particularly like, why is it that so many theists in the physics department, I guess, don't embrace the multiverse? If like, as you said it later, it's sort of like, there's a good possibility that it strengthens the argument itself. Um, again, I can't speak for other people. I mean, I'm experimental physicist. I go where the evidence points to. Right now, there's no evidence for a multiverse. I see no reason to um, invoke imaginary things that are unnecessary. If we ever find evidence for it, then I will go study it. If I find evidence for it, I'll win the Nobel Prize. So that would be great. <laughs> right? But, you know, to me, I'm going to say let's talk about this, let's see if this is the, the nail that kills Christianity or kills theism or whatever, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about, like I said here, there's so many multiverse theories, you could spend your life figuring out which one is right and what their implications are, but let's wait till we see the evidence. Again, you know, you can talk to any professor on campus. Uh, Micah Green sitting in the back there, right? They're so focused on their r tiny research and what they do, they don't think about anything else in general. Well, you may be an exception, all right? <laughs> but uh, in general, you know, my physics colleagues, as far as their intellectual pursuits, are worried about physics and OU football, and that's it, <laughs> right? Yes? So um, when we're talking about fine tuning, we always bring up how unlikely it is that we would find another planet that supports life like ours. Do you know what chances are that we would find another planet that is exactly like any other planet in the universe? Like another planet that exactly fits the specifications for Mercury to be Yeah, um, no I don't. What I do know is that um, it seems like, it's partially a selection effect, but it seems like lots of the solar systems we're seeing have some commonalities. A huge Jupiter-like planet orbiting close to the star. But again, part of that is a selection effect because you look for, one of the ways to look for extrasolar planets is look for wobbles in the star, and that happens with large planets nearby. Um, so I don't know the answer, but, but what's, um, to me, the, the relevant question again is this question of life. Um, is it possible that in 10 to the 22 planets in the visible universe, one is likely to have intelligent life? By the, or, or life more complex than bacteria. I didn't really say that. Bacteria can thrive anywhere. I expect us to find bacteria probably even on the planets in our solar system because the Earth has sent bacteria all over the solar system. So we will find evidence, in my opinion, of my prediction of bacteria on Mars. It'll make huge news because they'll say they found evidence for life on Mars. And upon further examination, which won't make huge news, we'll realize it was just life that got transported from the Earth to Mars. <laughs> right. Well, the, the, the storyline will be it will maybe started there and then transported to Earth, as if that makes it better or easier. Right. Um, but again, God could have started with life on Mars and transported it here. I don't know. And if God made one planet that's suitable for higher life forms, he could have made a whole bunch, regardless of the odds. Um, so the odds is just a way of saying, let's not be flippant about the statement that, of course, there gotta be lot, there's got to be lots of life because there are lots of planets. Let's at least be a little more thoughtful than that if you're going to make the argument that life like us might be common. Yeah. So when you're talking about like creation of stars and how you have like a second or third generation stars and how those are created, how does that line up with the Genesis account? Yeah, so um, I didn't talk about that. I have an hour talk at least on how Genesis lines up with modern cosmology and we could start now and see how late <laughs> they kick us out if you want. Um, so the short answer is I believe the best understanding of the six days of creation are six periods of time. And I believe that the writer did not intend those days to mean 24 hours. 
And when I read scholars who study ancient Hebrew language and culture, uh, one of the best scholars of that culture and language is a guy named Gleason Archer. And in one of his books, he writes that um, he believes the writer of Genesis, his words are, could not have intended the days of creation to be 24 hours. And so, you know, in English, you read it, you go, this looks like 24 hours. Ancient Hebrew, for instance, has no word that means epic. They have a word, olam, that means an infinite period of time or from eternity. But if the writer wanted to say there are six um, eras or epics of creation, the, word, the only word he has in ancient Hebrew is the, the word yom, which we translate day. So I think it means six periods of time, and it actually fits really well with the chronology. Um, ancient Hebrew has about 8,000 words, 3,000 roots only. English has about a million words, over 200,000 in common usage. And so ancient Hebrew has so few words that even in English, the word day can mean many things. If I say in, in George Washington's day, the colonists fought the Revolutionary War, in that context, day means an epic or an era. But in ancient Hebrew, not only does day mean an epic or an era at times, there is no word for epic or era. So I just think that the writer is saying God created in six periods of time. I talk about that in my book. Um, and good scholars of Hebrew, many good scholars of Hebrew, it, it, it's debated. But many good scholars would agree that those days are definitely not 24 hours. Yeah, so the book talks about how I think it actually lines up perfectly, the account of Genesis, with what we've studied in modern science. And I even talk a little bit about the language of the day and why I think that's true. Yeah? Uh, pertaining to the origin of the universe, what sort of discovery would provide evidence against God as a source? Well, I think if we had found out the universe was eternal, because the, which was the presupposition before 1929, because the Bible seems to make it clear that this universe is finite and had a beginning. And so I think if the evidence had pointed otherwise, that would have been hard to describe and put into a creator if this one had no evidence that it was created. I mean, a believer could still say, well, it was created, we just don't have evidence for it. But, you know, a hundred years ago, if you had said in a hundred years from now, um, we will ha know more or less all about the beginning of the universe, except for the first 10 to the minus 12 seconds, we will understand its um, history, its um, development over 14 billion years. People would have thought you were crazy, that that would just, and, and, and the fact that, I mean, some of the people when the Big Bang was first proposed were actually believers who said, this can't be true, because if the universe had a beginning, there's no excuse not to believe in God. They thought it would be so much evidence for God that everyone would have to believe. And there were Christian scientists who said, said, this can't be true, because then no one will not be able to believe. But people find a way not to believe regardless, right? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, so all the evidence we discussed points to the existence of a God, but why specifically the Christian? So that's a great question. Um, the evidence I've, I haven't gone into a lot of the evidence. So the evidence does give you some characteristics of the creator. Um, if the universe was created, the universe can't be God. That rules out pantheism. Um, the universe doesn't seem to be cyclic. It seems to have a beginning and it's going to expand forever or something like that. So um, worldviews that require cycles like Hinduism seem to be ruled out. The universe seems to have a purpose for humans. Even some non-theist scientists say this. So any universe that makes a god simply deist who doesn't care about the creation seems to be ruled out. So there's lots of indications within the science that the creator looks a lot like the Christian God. But ultimately, you know, Christianity is based on whether Jesus of Nazareth lived and died and rose again. So to ultimately get to the Christian God, you have to go outside of science into the historical evidence for the resurrection, whether that occurred. Um, so this is a beginning step to say, is there a God? Okay, here's evidence for the possibility of a God. What does that God look like? Okay, there's evidence it's some kind of Christian-like God. Is Christianity true? Go study the resurrection, see if it's true. Yes? I'm interested in this inflation because I don't, 
I mean, you said something like physics and the laws of physics can explain everything, but that seems to be something that implies a different physics. Uh, yeah, so inflation would be something we don't have a cause for yet. The reason inflation has been proposed is because there are other fine-tuning parts of the universe, something called the horizon problem, something called the flatness problem, that look finely tuned. Mm -hmm. So God could have just done them that way. But inflation is a mechanism that explains some of this other stuff that looks finely tuned. So you take three or four problems that we have with the Big Bang that, again, they're not problems if you believe in a designer. They just seem to w work too well. And inflation gives a mechanism to explain those things. So there's good reasons to believe inflation might be true. But yes, nobody knows what started inflation, how inflation ended. So it looks like even inflation might have to be fine-tuned. And, and the reason we believe it is because um, it's got solid theoretical evidence and it solves problems. Um, but yeah, you know, um, we don't know. Yeah. So when they put, I mean, I've seen it, I use it in class, that you've got the cone model of the universe, right. and you have inflation, and then they have, on the little graphic on Google Images, it says quantum fluctuation. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of a plug in there. Yeah. And I always put a big question mark on that. Yeah, in fact, we can't just when I that, look yeah. for images to put in my slideshow, I try to avoid the ones that say com quantum fluctuations. Instead, I'll get the ones that say Big Bang or something. Yeah. Because the quantum fluctuation is an editorial comment, yeah. even much more so than inflation. Again, inflation has some strong um, reasons to think it may have happened. It solves problems. When you have one thing that solves multiple problems simultaneously, it's a good indication that that one thing might be correct. And that's, that's one of the motivations for inflation. But, um, but yeah, the quantum fluctuation is purely editorial. Yeah. Yes. So you talk about that like one to the how many seconds the very beginning. Yeah, well, we know for sure everything from ten to the minus twelve seconds till now. So why don't we know the exact part? What prevents our math from So a, a couple things. So if inflation occurred, then observational evidence before inflation would have more or less disappeared. There might be some things like the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation that would give us clues, but mostly it would have disappeared. The real problem is, okay, so our, our accelerators, like where I work at CERN, the energy density of the collision is about 10 to the minus 12th or 13th seconds after the Big Bang. So we recreate the energy density at that point. So from that point on, we can actually do experiments that test all the theories. So that's the point that's really solid. Before that, you start to run computer models and based on physics that you know. But eventually, you come to this, quote, singularity, if you take the physics you know. That's a true infinity. Most people think that if your equations say you have an infinite result, there's a problem with the equations. And that's the real bottom line. It's this, what um, um, part of the reason is we have a theory of gravity called general relativity. We have a theory of the small world called quantum mechanics, and those two theories are incompatible. But at the early universe, you have a really small world, and gravity was there, but we don't have a theory that describes that, a quantum theory of gravity. And so really just all of our speculative ideas mathematically break down. So we really don't know. And you know, again, the exact time that is, who knows? Um, at t equals zero is where everything technically breaks down. But um, uh, so, you know, somewhere between t equals zero and where things are definitely uncertain, and t equals 10 to the minus 12th, where things are definitely certain, the equations start to break down and things start to become speculative. Um, you had a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you talk about the, uh, the Big Bang implies the origin of the universe, and that has the four basic elements. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So you're asking me, you know, 
to describe something I have no experience in. So an example I often give, no, but an example I often give is I can describe a circle. I can des describe a sphere. Circle is two-dimensional. Sphere is three-dimensional. The simplest object in four dimensions would be a four-dimensional sphere. And I can write a mathematical equation for it, but I have no idea what it looks like. I cannot describe it. Um, even though I can write an equation for it. And it's only the next step, circle, sphere, the next thing. So what I've learned from mathematics is that if I don't experience it, it's almost impossible for me to describe. That doesn't mean it can't be there. If you were a four-dimensional being, you'd easily understand a four-dimensional sphere. So I don't know what it means to exist outside of time. There's speculation that maybe there is a plane of time and God lives in multiple dimensions of time and we live along a linear time. And so he acted in these other dimensions of time before ours. There's, an, uh, there's different theories of what time is. There's something called an A theory of time and a B theory of time. No physicist knows what time is. We don't understand time at all. We don't understand why it's the fourth dimension but in the equations, it has an imaginary number in front of it, and it moves in one direction, but everything else moves in multiple directions. So um, you're asking me a question I can't answer, but I could speculate. I could speculate that if God lived in two dimensions of time, then he could have made a dimension that starts, you know, one line in one dimension, and that's our universe. Is that the answer? Probably not but at least it's a plausible answer that I could understand. Um, what does it mean you know, to have causality without time? Well, there's such thing as logical causality and there's temporal causality. Causality doesn't necessarily have to be you know, um, a time thing. And so um, I don't know the answer, but um, I'll tell you another thing that is a positive for me for Christianity. There are things that the Bible claims are true that I can't understand. Now, if everything the Bible claimed was true I could understand, then I would say this is definitely a human-made book because everything is understandable. But if there's a divine being who lives outside of space and time and is trying to explain himself to me, there's going to be things I don't understand but are true. And so the fact that there are makes me even have more confidence in the Bible as somehow a unique book. Because there are things like, what does it mean for God to have the beginning of time? Or to, There's a verse in the Bible that says that God gave us grace before the beginning of time. It's the only holy book in the world that act explicitly says before the beginning of time. Well, where'd the author get that idea, right? Um, and so to me, those things I don't understand don't weaken the case, particularly when science now says there was a before the beginning of time. They actually strengthen the case. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the visible universe. Do we have any estimates ah. uh, of, what's, uh, of how big the universe is beyond the visible universe? Yes, there's a minimum size. So in the same way that if you look at the Earth, it looks flat but we know it's not. And if you could look far enough out, you would begin to see the curvature. Well, we can look out the universe. It's, it's analogy, so don't take it too, too far. We can look at the universe and see that as far as we can see, it looks flat. So you can say, but it, so if it is curved, what's the minimum it could be curved and still look flat to us? And when you do that, you get something like, I forget the number, like um, 200 and like nine, it's got to be at least nine trillion times bigger than we can see. So if you apply that to the rare Earth probabilities... Doesn't make a difference. 10 to the 12th makes no difference in 10 to the 282. <laughs> okay? But it might be bigger than that. That's the minimum. Okay? And so that's another way around it. The universe itself, even the visible universe, even the real universe, our universe, is 10 to the 282 times bigger than we can see. And so there's one planet like us. Now, if the... Uh, but, but again, now you're appealing to gaps. If, if the uh, rest of the uh, universe were flat, it would be visible? Uh, no. Okay. The visible universe is dictated by the speed of light. Okay. And so this is all we will ever see. In fact, we're going to see less and less of it. So um, if the universe... Yeah, we will see less and less of it, not more and more of it. And so... Um, 
we will never know the answer unless there's another way to measure it that we haven't thought of yet. Yeah. Piggybacking on that, if the universe is expanding, uh, then it, in order to expand, it must have a, a limit. It must have a boundary, a size. Mm -mm. It, no? Mm -mm. <laughs> Imagine an infinite sheet of rubber that is being stretched. Can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have an infinite sheet of rubber, and every point locally is still getting bigger. But overall, it would not be getting bigger. Yeah. Well, there's more. Actually, it would be. Well, I don't know the answer. <laughs> because because infinite. If, it, if, if it's not infinite, if we know that it's. Right. If it has a beginning in, in size and time and space. We don't know that it has a beginning in size. We know that. Okay. What we do know is that the visible universe was once the size of a pinpoint. Okay. But, but there could have been an infinite number of pinpoints at that time. And they've all grown to the size this big. And that's all we know. So again, you know, all these, all these probability arguments may be ridiculous if the universe is 10 to the 300 times bigger. But, but now you're speculating. Now you're appealing to God of the gaps or atheism of the gaps or whatever you want to call it. Well, where I was actually going with that yeah. was not a, a defense or a, right. an argument against theism, but if there was a boundary, like, is, is, there, is there a scientific thought that perhaps the universe does have a contained space, and then beyond that, is there speculation, is there a theory as to what is outside of that? Right. So again, when, when we try to describe this in terms, we always describe the universe as two-dimensional rather than three. Because if I have a two-dimensional plane, I can twist that and you can understand it because we have a third dimension to twist it in. If I have a three-dimensional object and I want to twist it into a fourth dimension, you can't picture that in your mind. So we always describe the universe as two-dimensional. Now, a, flat, a truly flat universe is an infinite sheet of a two-dimensional piece of paper. What we call a closed universe would be like the surface of a beach ball or a globe. And it's possible the universe is closed. It's possible that if I go far enough in that direction, I will come back to where I started in the universe. Okay? And we just don't know. If it is closed, if it is like that, the surface is, so, uh, is curved so little that we can't perceive it. But it's still possible that it's 9 trillion times bigger or something. And if I go far enough that way, I come back to where I started. And, and what's beyond it, we don't know. The universe is that surface, and we have no idea what's beyond that surface. That's all we can test scientifically. So we know that if it's, at least if it's a closed sphere, there's something inside and there's something outside, but those aren't the universe. They, we don't have a clue that there is even such a thing as inside or outside. Again, this is you know, what we can measure and what we can speculate about. Yeah. All right. That means it's time to be done. Um, I'll, I'll stick around if you have other questions. All right. Everyone.